Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Byron Ray of Wolf Dog Armory. I met Byron at the Texas Custom Knife Show when I was helping check makers in, and he strode up with a massive bowie slung over his shoulder like a sword. Later, I broke bread with Byron at the evening's barbecue meet and greet and got a glancing picture of what inspired him to turn his knife making hobby into a serious uh, prospect for a retirement career. His work is firmly rooted in classic American patterns, hunters, scalpers, choppers, from what I've seen, and what seems to be his favorite, buoys. We'll find out why and how forging has been Byron's therapy, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and download us wherever you listen to podcasts. And join us on Patreon, where you can get all the free extras, uh, including interview extras from the interview we're about to have here. So uh, be sure to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check it out. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Byron, welcome to the show, sir. Oh, thank you for having me, sir. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's good to see you too. And uh, uh, we had a chance to catch up on the phone the other day. That was that was cool. And I was um, I was sort of recollecting to you uh, my first impression of you. You came walking up with that gigantic bowie and i was like oh man i'm gonna ask this guy you know you can't walk around with a knife like that without asking to see it um let's break the ice that way i'm pretty sure you have it right around you let's see this thing this was my first impression of you so it is so big that i opted for a sling to ride under your arm and shoulder here Let me see if I can get it centered on the screen. It's too big for the screen. <laughs> <laughs> big old Muso Bowie with the, or Bowie Bowie. You know, man, I'm going to be jumping around. I'm trying to get myself to say Bowie, but I'm a Yank. So it's always been Bowie. Uh, that back strap of copper, what's that all about? So this whole knife came about as a contest of sorts. Uh, Sam Towns out of Australia does his annual Bowie build off. And at the same time, he uh, announced his contest, which required a buoy to be at least 10 inches long and have a sparring bar on it. At the same time, I had just watched the 2004 version of the Alamo, and Jim Bowie carried something similar to this. And I thought, okay, I want to build that knife. Let's do this. Now, the whole thing about a sparring bar is kind of silly to me. The idea is it's literally for blocking in a knife fight. I mean, if I'm in a knife fight, I'm swinging for the fences, you know, <laughs> I hope I'm never being one. But the idea is if you block with the backside of the blade, this is a renewable resource. You can replace this. It doesn't damage the spine of the blade. You're not damaging the cutting edge. So that's the whole thing behind the sparring bar, which I, I just learned this in the last year, but it's kind of, I get it, but it seems silly. Yeah. Yeah. I've also heard that those are used because... Uh, it's a softer metal. It might catch the blade, you know, catch the sharp end of the, and, and to me, you know, that they're all, uh, cool theories. Uh, but, but the reality of Bowie knife fighting, I would imagine is not that, um, nuanced. I, I would imagine it, like you said, there's a lot of swinging for the fence. It's yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be brutal. I don't ever want to be in a knife fight. I've, I've always been told if you're in a knife fight, you've lost already. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, you, Cause you're not coming out of it without getting cut. Yeah, I've been told uh, the guy who wins is the guy who dies second, <laughs> which right. I always thought was exactly, kind of funny. exactly. So, but, okay, uh, where 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 did you come from with this giant, beautiful piece of cutlery here? Um, I happen to know, and I'm going to tell everyone now, uh, you're a self-professed uh, IT nerd, as you said it, but but really, you're one of those guys who keep our modern day infrastructure going uh, in, in the IT realm. How did you get into knife making? Well. I have been a knife nerd my entire life. I've always loved knives. I've always carried knives. And I always carry multiple knives because two is one, one is none. And uh, I was, uh, 
I made my first knife when I was 18 years old. And it was that little boot knife right there. Ooh. And it's a kit. I didn't make the blade. Um, when I was working for my father down in Houston, Texas, I discovered right across the street from where we picked up our tempered glass, he was a glazer doing commercial storefront, uh, was a place called Texas Knife Maker Supply. And I was like, ooh, we have to stop in there. We have to stop. And I hounded him for a week or two. And finally, he stopped one day. We had a few extra minutes. And I went in and dropped, I have no idea how much money on a some brass scales, this blank, and some coca bola wood, and some brass pins. And I went home and attempted to shape a handle and do you know, just a little bit of file work and stuff. And nice. I made my first knife, and I was hooked. It. I spent two days out there doing this with hand tools and epoxy and stuff. And, I mean, it's simple. There's nothing special about it. But I was hooked. And then I didn't make another knife for 20 years. <laughs> 20 hooked? But uh, Jones in for twenty years. Uh, well, I I made uh, I made the uh, classic mistake that a lot of men make, and I'm kidding, it wasn't a mistake. But I got married, and upon getting married, I instantly had a stepson, instantly owned a home, and had my wife, and was working for the school district. I've been twenty eight years in IT in the school district, and life got busy. And my wife, um, my wife likes to grow, liked to grow things. Uh, she had four kinds of cancer over her life, um, breast cancer three times. Uh, but anyway, it was just, I never had funding. I was paying doctors. I, and I was just taking care of her, taking care of the house and, you know, doing my thing. And then I, uh, when she got cancer the second time, breast cancer was the first time we could never cut it out and send it down the hall. Um, I kind of lost my mind because I'm a guy. I'm an IT nerd. I fix things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, it's it's what I do. I can't help myself. If you come to me and start talking about a problem, I'm working on a solution. It's just in my DNA. So when I couldn't fix her, I couldn't help her. All I could do is take all the load off of her, do the housework, whatever, and just take you know everything off of her I could, but I couldn't fix her. Hmm. I kind of started losing my mind. I don't like being helpless. I don't do helpless. And I started looking for something to do with my hands. And she went and left me unsupervised. She went with her girlfriends down to Florida one weekend for, uh, for a long weekend, like five days. She came back and I had built a soup can forge in my garage and hammered out my first knife shaped object. I mean, it's not a knife. That's it. Hey, it's that's a knife. It's a knife shaped object. I mean, I put a nice little twist on it. That was my very first forged knife. That was 2013. So uh, you're saying you made that in a soup can forge? I made. I started off, I mean, the backstory is I found this railroad spike on my grandfather's workbench. My grandfather passed away in 1997, so he'd been gone 16 years at this point. But I found this on his workbench, and I brought it home because I'm sentimental like that and silly. And uh, she was, uh, my wife had went on her trip, and I walked out, and I found this thing, and I looked at it, and I said, you know, people make knives out of these. How do you do that? I was left unsupervised and got asked myself a question and I started looking around and I first thing I found is that propane forges cost $700 entry price. Okay, that's out. I don't have funding for that. And I started doing a little more research and then I found a YouTube video of this guy that took a uh, literally a large can of soup, plaster of Paris, playground sand and a benzomatic torch and made a soup can forge. I mean, it's this big. And, uh, I thought I can do that. And uh, twenty dollars later, I already had the torch. I bought some playground sand, plaster of Paris, and a can of Bush's baked beans. I ate the beans, and <laughs> next thing you know, I'm hammering out railroad spike knives. And that's where I started was railroad spike knives, which I think is just about every bladesmith that's ever started started on either railroad spike knives or farrier's rasp. Yeah, I made one at uh, the Texas Custom Knife Show. I, I pounded out a my own approximation of a knife using a uh, uh a actually it, it was a horseshoe yep <clears throat> yeah uh 
Uh, but I didn't get to grind it. Someone else did a beautiful job on that. But um, it, it, I, I want to go back to something you said. You don't do helpless. You're talking about how you couldn't fix your wife. And, um, you know, I've been trying to get to the bottom of the knife obsession for a long time. And a big part of it to me is the idea of self-reliance and oh, um, how, how a knife is uh, you know, paramount. You know, it's like a, it's prerequisite to that, uh, to self-reliance, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, it's in like any one sort of, the first of tools, it's like yes. one of the first tools that right. man started to carry. Exactly. So, um, I, I put those together and, and I, I see you kind of in that same camp where, um, you know, how do I make this knife? Oh, I'll figure this out. So I, I'm interested in, you know, you do, you do these two kinds of things that are in very opposite worlds, um, it and knife forging, um, they're, they're in seemingly very different worlds, but is there any sort of um, crossover in terms of your thinking or your uh, your mental approach? It's all thinking. It's being an IT nerd is I mean I'm at A. I need to get to D, and it's figuring out what B and C is. And it's the same thing with knife making for me. Was I, I asked the question? It's like okay, I have this. I know they make knives out of this. How do you do this? And then I start, I start doing research. And I like to tell people that I'm a graduate of the University of YouTube. I hold a master's degree in Reddit and a PhD in Google. <laughs> that's, you know, that's IT nerds in general. We're not the smartest people. We're just better at Google than everybody else. <laughs> you know, we we can sure. figure this stuff out. And so for me, it was needing to do something with my hands because. I was kind of having this, I don't know, midlife crisis or something because my wife is sick. I can't fix her. And then I'm kind of looking at my own life going, okay, everything I do is digital. Nothing I do lasts. When I was 15, I was working for my father and I can still drive by places and show you that I put in that storefront. I built that. Nothing I do in my, my IT world will last. I mean, it's all it's all in the cloud. It's all on somebody else's computer. I mean, I ran an email server for us that I built from the ground up for 17 years. It no longer exists in any form or fashion. The data is gone because we retired it seven years ago. So mm -hmm. I felt the need to do something with my hands, do something and actually make something that I can hold. And so I started knife making became my therapy. In fact, that's the tagline of my of my forge is the art of recreational hammer therapy. Uh, I don't care how bad of a day you've had. You can go outside, fire up the forge, throw a piece of steel in it. You can write on that piece of steel whatever your, you know, whatever was vexing you this day. Maybe it was cancer. Maybe it was your boss's name. <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever. But uh, you can throw that in the forge and heat it up and then you can work out all your frustrations and maybe by the time you're done you've created something beautiful so yeah it's that uh and the idea of what what comes out of it long lasting you're dealing with elements that are um you know steel and wh how, however you're building the handles these are things that are going to outlast us and i would exactly. imagine at the time when you sp sparked up the the forge for the first time really that was probably on your mind permanence and non-permanence and all that and uh that's something that uh people keep coming back to who, who i interview uh here is that there's a sense that that uh they're they're able to not make themselves immortal in any way but they're able to you know make their mark things are so fleeting, you know, if you can leave knowing you've left, uh, you know, a number of knives out there that you have no idea where they are, or what their stories are and how they're getting passed down through their families and all that. But the fact that you made them and put them out there is something. I am turning 50 years old in March. So I have <laughs> somewhere between zero and 50 years left approximately. But some of the knives I've made in the last three years are going to be handed down to people's great grandchildren. You know, there's no reason they shouldn't last. I mean, unless you just leave it outside or something, you know. Yeah. So, yes, it's 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 something that will last long after me. And at the end of the day, they're all tools, but in some cases they're art. Uh, it's just. It was something to do that just when I was, you know, every time I finish a knife, it's just like 
okay, wow, I made this. I, I can't believe that I made this. How did I do this? Yeah. It's well, you know, it's not surprising to me that that's where you went either, because uh, like like I said, uh, military guys, engineers and IT uh, like uh, engineers, like uh, mechanical and product engineers and uh, military guys seem to go into knife making. I think there's something uh, that that is relatable in that without following certain order of things. Uh, you don't get a the, knife. The number it's it's funny because the number of military guys that I know that make knives and the number of IT guys, it's it's crazy the number of IT guys that do this. And I think a lot of it is because we write a desk. We need something to do with our hands at the end of the day. I've been sitting behind a keyboard for eight hours and it's just I'm going nuts. I need to I need to do something to kind of release some get some exercise, release some pent up frustration. I mean, there is. I mean, I'm in my town. Um, this um, city of Conroe is uh, one of their IT guys. Is Nick? Is Nick from Nick's Knives? Yeah. I mean, he he's an IT guy just like me, and I think he's planning on retiring at some point and going full time into knife making, just like me. Okay, so let let's get back to this uh, this soup can forge. You build the soup can forge. You make you make your first knife, which we just saw, which is cool to see. It's awesome that you've held on to it. Um, where, where do you go from there? Uh, did you build a bunch of knives in that soup can forge and graduate out of it or how, how did that I work? started making, uh, railroad spike knives. I made probably 30 or 40 of those and I sold them to friends and family and people that just happened to hear about them on, uh, Facebook through word of mouth. And every time I would sell one, I would turn around and take the money and I would buy a new tool. I would buy, you know, starting off with angle grinders. And then I bought a Harbor Freight 1x30 grinder. You know, I mean, I should have had a banner sponsored by Harbor Freight because that was most <laughs> of my tools when I first started. Um, but uh, I started with that. And then, was, I, I, you know, I grew out of it, got tired of them. I, I don't know. But I was like, you know what? I want to I want to make I want to try and make a real knife, not a railroad spike knife. And I actually made my, fir my first um, full tang knife and uh, gave it to my dad. Now, the thing is, he still has it, and I really don't want anybody to ever see it because <laughs> um, it's mild steel. <laughs> oh, <laughs> goodness. I, I didn't know what I didn't know. I was still so green behind the ears, you know, wet behind the ears. I, I made a mild steel knife. And then I moved from there. I moved to Farrier's Rasp. I uh, made friends with a farrier here in town, and I would trade him a case of beer, and he'd bring me about 30 Farrier's Rasp, and I started oh. making knives out of that. Okay, wait. Hold, hold up for one second. Um, just going back to the um, the spike knives. Are, are those railroad spikes? I, I know railroad ties are not hardened. They're work hardened by, by trains rolling over them over and over and over. They get hardened that way. Um, but the steel that goes into this, can you harden that? Not really. Okay. These make fun knives. They don't make good knives. They are, they are, most of them are mild steel. You can get some high carbon steel railroad spike knives and are generally marked with an HC on the cap. Oh, okay. But even those are not that high carbon. It, you can put an edge on it. You can make them cut. They will not stay sharp. It's they're they're not good knives. They're just fun. And if you're starting yeah. out, they teach you they teach you forging technique. They teach you grind technique. I mean, you could you can make a functional knife with it. It just doesn't make a good knife. Right, right, right. But you're but you're kind of cutting your teeth, hammering and and learning how to shape hot metal without necessarily maybe burning through the good stuff. And it's a way of learning cheaply. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and developing that bucket full of. Uh, you know, high value steel knives that you can never use. I have a five gallon bucket full of railroad spikes that I collected when I first started. And I had, I told people, I told my friends about it and I had people just bringing me bags and buckets of them that they, you know, my grandpa collected these and uh, I've kept them because I've started turning, uh, I've started hammering these things out as, and uh, making stake turners out of them. And I made a couple of stake turners and that's fun. And I actually have a special set that was given to me by, my neighbor about eight houses down and uh he is a maintenance guy working on tinker air force base oh oh and, my, my. And he co collected these spikes from tinker air force base and i'm gonna make some stake turners 
out of those. My my father served at that Air Force Base right before I was born. So I, I never lived there, but my brother and sister did. Tinker okay, Force so Base I need to make you a steak turner out of one of these. I, I, or, I a, or a knife. Or a knife, you know. <laughs> or a knife. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, 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 the uh, Before I move on to the rasp, I want to talk about the farrier and, and, and that. But um, I, I'm going to nerd out here for a second and say that I – where I went to school, there was a railroad track behind where I went to college and we used to wander around in the woods. And that's when I first discovered railroad track, uh, um, uh, the spikes. And I would nerd out over them because man, someone was here, man. And someone pounded this in years ago. Like, like there is history in each one of those spikes and there's blood, sweat and tears. And, uh, they are kind of interesting. I could almost see why someone would collect them. Uh, but certainly turning them into something uh, with a new life is kind of a a, a, a valiant, F, uh, I don't know, a, a cool thing to do. You know, I mean, it's something that was scrap anyway. I mean, you know, because most of the time when they're pulled, they're never used again. They're, they might be recycled, but it's a great place for a beginning smith to start. I mean, I, I don't care how well you're funded. I recommend starting on them just because it teaches you technique. It teaches you moving metal. And especially yeah. if you're starting out like I did, I had an anvil about this big. It weighed about eight pounds. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had a $20 uh, tractor supply, you know, hammer, three pound hammer. And that's what I started with. And a pair of Allen wrenches, you know, for not Allen wrenches, uh, crescent wrenches for, uh, you oh, know, holding, right. on to, holding on to it. You know, I, I didn't have tongs. I didn't have anything. I was starting off with nothing. And like I said, I started making the railroad spike knives. I sold some of those and, Next thing you know, I built a coal burning forge and I bought myself a decent pair of tongs and I was off to the races then. Yeah. Yeah. But before that, you were Rambo in the field, you know, <laughs> fashioning knives out of the raw elements. So so you you were talking about uh, developing a relationship with a farrier and getting a bunch of rasps. Now, I saw those knives on your Instagram page, uh, some beautiful uh uh, Bowie knives. Uh, I, I know I remember seeing some sort of recurve chopper things and stuff like that. What's it like working with these rasps and do farriers that they, they just go through them and then they can't do anything with them. I'm like the, the files wear out quickly. And so they, you know, they buy these things for 30 bucks and then they turn around and, and get 15 cents for them at the scrapyard. I mean, they, uh -huh. every farrier has got a bucket of these worn out, worn out rasps. And so, you know, they're, they're taking them to the scrapyard, but they're getting pennies on the dollar. And uh, so I just, I just posted on my, uh, my Facebook page going, Hey, any farriers out there? And I had people, re you know, refer me and uh, I made friends with one and I was like, man, I would like some, cause I'm going to try and make some knives out of your, you know, your worn out stuff that you're going to throw away or take to the scrapyard. And he goes, he goes, I like shiner beer. <laughs> so, yes, sir. I'll have a case of Shiner beer for you. And uh, we met in the parking lot at my work and he handed me a big box of like 30 different rasp in it. Wow. And uh, yeah, and you know, I, I was making, I was making those, um, I started making knives out of that and, you know, I was selling those for 150 bucks a pop and, uh, you know, for just full tang or the occasional hidden tang with an antler handle and stuff. And you know, because I didn't know what I was doing. I was still learning. And uh, I mean, I, I, I was, I'm self-taught in everything. I mean, like I said, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants. I, I watched, I've watched all these experts and stuff. I mean, and I've learned from, you know, I mean, I bought every DVD that Jay Nielsen put out. <laughs> Just, right. So uh, I, that's where I started. And Every time I would sell a knife, I never made any money at this because every time I'd sell a knife, I'd go buy a new tool, you know, sell a couple of knives and come back with, uh, you know, uh, carbide file guides or buying, you know, I mean, the big day for me was when I traded the Harbor Freight one by 30 and bought a Grizzly two by 72. It was a $500 grinder at the time, but oh my Lord, I went from, you know, I spent when I started, I made a Bowie knife, my very first Bowie knife I made for one of my best friends for his 40th birthday. I spent like four days grinding on this thing in the evenings because that Harbor Freight thing was so slow, so <laughs> underpowered, and so terrible. When I got the new Grizzly, that 2x72, and I bought a good 2x72, you know, uh, like a Norton Blaze or something at the time. I mean, I've moved on to other people now, but um, I took that. I took that Norton Blaze and I said, all right, I'm just going to start with a, you know, 
just a, a file. And I want to see how fast I can do this. And I had a shaped knife ready to go, ready for heat treat in 18 minutes. Wow. So that's the speed difference of having, you know, I mean, you know, Wayne Goddard wrote the $50 knife shop. And yeah, yeah you can make knives with, you know, you don't have to have a drill press. You can have a $5 hand drill you bought at a yard sale. You know, you can have a just a regular claw hammer and a, you know, I mean, an anvil shaped object and you can make it work. I mean, you could, you could build up, you know, a fire pit in the ground and get a piece of steel hot enough that you can heat it up and beat on it. That being said, having the right tools is nice. So, so you were, you're, yeah, no doubt about that in whatever your pursuit is. Uh, but you were talking about uh, you then made a charcoal forge. What are some of the disadvantages to that? There, there are a couple of guys on YouTube I've been following for years. Uh, you know, two of them are Polish knife makers who, even after years and years, still use charcoal forges. Uh, they have really cool setups. But um, I know that there have to be like because uh, like people who are serious for. Uh, uh, bladesmiths in the United States, they're always going for uh, a propane forge. Well, there's multiple reasons for that. And for me, the, the coal burning forge was the next step because it was, you know, coal was readily available. There was a uh, fair air supply house nearby and uh, I mean, 20 minutes from me. And so I could buy 50 or 80 pound bags of uh, coal really, relatively cheaply. The downside to coal is I'm operating in my garage. I can't do that inside. Ooh. So I had to set up in the driveway. It had to be a nice day. It couldn't be a threat of rain. It takes, took me an hour to get the coal burning forge up to heat. Mm. It, um, it, it just, it's time consuming and it's messy. And here's the funny part. So my wife, my late wife was, um, she was about half hippie. So here she is trying to lower her carbon footprint and I'm burning coal in the driveway. <laughs> I love that. So my birthday rolled around one year and I looked at her and said, I would really like to build a coal, uh, a uh, propane forge. I have found some designs on YouTube and everything else. And I think I can do this for like 250 bucks, you know, buying my own pipes and, and taking a old propane tank and cutting it up, lining it with K wool and, you know, uh, Satanite for refractory. And, uh, she was like, this means you're going to stop burning coal in the driveway? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an easy sell. And uh, I built it over about a course of about a week and a half. And, you know, it was just originally, it was just a simple one venturi burner. And uh, I used it like that for a while. And then I converted it to forced air by putting a, uh, a blower on it. And when I did that, oh, my Lord, it got so hot. It got it got very hot. I set the cart on fire underneath it. I had to do some modifications to it. <laughs> Whoa, wait, wait. But uh, so you're, you're talking about you have a, a propane jet coming through the top. So it it's uh, it's just a peep, piece of black iron pipe. It's got um, um, goes from one to two inch on either end. And it's gas is being ignited down in. And when you light the fire on this end, it's sucking air from the other end like a jet engine. That's a Venturi burner. Now, it's sucking its own air by force of the combustion. Now, what I did later was cap off the end with a hose and a blower, so it actually is air being forced through. So yeah, instead yeah. of sucking air, it's forced air. Yeah, and that, that's like a ramjet. <laughs> it yes, it went from I mean, it went from okay, I can get things up to where I can forge to I got to the point I could forge weld if I wanted to. Wow. I mean, it it made it made a colossal difference going to forced air and I'm still using that forge. I bought the stuff a year ago to build a, a bigger one. That's going to be a ribbon burner, which is more efficient and burns hotter, but uh, hasn't been time for that. I keep, I keep finding my shelf in the middle of show prep. It's, you know, it's like, okay, my next show is in two months. I got to build my inventory, you know, and I still have a day job. Well, so you seem to be the, uh, a really good example of, um, not letting um, not letting expense and machinery be your, um, what am I trying to say? Your bar to entry. You know, like sometimes it's like, oh, well, I can't start this because I can't afford the machine or this or that, or I, I can't afford a $3,000 forge. You can really, you can really start for dirt cheap. 
you can start with next to nothing. And that's what I did. I started with absolutely, you know, the absolute bare minimum. I mean, I had a lot of hand tools and stuff, but I mean, in terms of, I, like I said, I started with a soup can forge. I then, my coal burning forge was built out of a brick drum and $40 of black iron pipe, two inch pipe and a $10 Walmart hair dryer. You don't think I got looks when I was buying that because I was spare at the time <laughs> and did, didn't have all this. I was clean shaven and I'm buying a hair dryer, you know, and that's I did that for a year or two. And then I, when I built the propane forge, that was a game changer. That really took it to the next level because I can walk out and have the forge up to heat in 20 minutes. I could do it rain or shine because I could do it inside the garage. I just put it near the door where it's venting out and I had, you know, it worked, it worked great. So I could, you know, any night of the week, I could go out and fire it up and start heating up and hammering. And that was, that was a game changer for me. And then I started, I just, every time I'd sell a knife, I'd buy better tools. And so I was self-funded for, I was self-funded for the first seven years that I was doing this. And it was just sell a knife, buy a tool, sell a knife, buy a tool, sell a knife, buy some more steel, buy some more knife handle material, you know, and I never made any money at it. It was just, you know, I was always chasing the next, what can get me the next performance upgrade? And uh, what changed after that, what really got me to this level was when my wife passed away. I, I had, we had life insurance on her. And when she passed away, I paid, we ran up a mountain of debt and I paid off all the medical bills. I paid off the house. I cleared the slate. I had no one for anything. And I asked myself at that point, because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I, I was lost. It was the first time, you know, first time I'd ever lived on my own. I had, uh, we'd been together for 23 years and I, I'd never lived alone. I never, you know, so I just didn't know what to do. And I was like, well, I love making knives. It's been my therapy. It's been our refuge through all this. And I think that's what I want to do with the rest of my life. I kind of want to be like Jim Poor, 90 years old, still working on stuff out in the shop, you know? And so I doubled down and I invested in my retirement career. And I built myself, it's had a two car garage, but it's every amateur knife maker's wet dream. I, uh, I started, I asked myself if money was no object, what would you buy? And I call that the Bugatti list. I scaled back to Cadillac and that's where I started buying. <laughs> Cadillac's a fine automobile, sir. You don't need a yes, Bugatti. I, wow. I didn't buy. I didn't buy the sixteen thousand dollar Anyang. I bought a twenty five, you know, pound Little Giant instead. You know. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm glad you mentioned what you just mentioned because I, I wanted to ask you that because it, it, it kind of begs the question, but it's kind of a difficult question to ask. How, how that major life change of, you know, losing your wife changed your approach or how you view a uh, knife making it i was lost uh for 20 years i was her caretaker i mean from we got married and six months later she had surgery and then she mm -hmm. had surgery every six to 12 months for the next five years and i was always chasing medical bills and chasing whatever and so i my job was to earn an income take care of her and i mean she worked too i mean she actually she taught school for uh, the last 11 years and she only retired in 2018 and uh because she just couldn't do it anymore and i you know laying down and dying wasn't an option so i was like what am i what do i want to do and it's like well this is what i truly love i mean this is this has been my refuge throughout all this and i it's i, I like to, every time i finish a knife I, I like to tell people it's uh it's like that scene in castaway with Tom Hanks, where he makes fire for the first time. Did you ever see that yeah. movie? Oh, yeah. It's like every time I finish a knife, it's, look, look what I have created. I, I have made fire. That's me. Every time I finish a knife, it's like, okay, this is awesome. I made this. But here are all the flaws. And I see more flaws than anybody because that's it's, it's the artist's mm -hmm. curse. And then I want to do better on the next one. And I'm always it's the IT nerd in me that always wants me to chase the next thing. What do I do for, what do I do next? What can I do to improve? How can I change things? And, oh my God, the rabbit holes I have gone down in the last three years. 
you know? Yeah. Well, well, I, I'm sitting here uh, thinking, and I, I keep uh, bouncing back and forth between, you know, um, computers and knives, and and it occurs to me that uh, when you're working with IT, your tools are not disposable, but they are renew, not even renewable. They go out of date somewhat quickly, and they get replaced, whether it's software or hardware. Whereas when you're making a knife, you're going for the exact opposite. You're going for a timeless design, or maybe you're going for something, you know, more flashy and unique. But you're going for something that is always going to work, and you're going for something that you hope lasts forever. You know, that's no, no one makes a knife hoping, oh, I, ho I hope this lasts 20 years. No, you're thinking like, you know, everyone always mentions going down through the generations. I hope my knives continue. So they're 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 very. They're very different. One's pretty ephemeral, and and one is so very not. I, I have I, I make two different kinds of knives. I mean, I make a production line of everyday carries. Let's see. Hunters. Let's see. We've been teasing about with talk. Show show what you're talking about. So, <laughs> like, that's a basic everyday carry. It's just over a four inch blade. Very simple. Fits in your hand. I have big hands, but I mean, it'll fit just about every hand. And this knife. It's a 3 16 inch spine, and I want you to just use and abuse this thing. I don't do a mirror polish. I do a satin, uh, do a satin scotch bright finish. I mean, you can still oh, see yeah. a little bit of lines in it and stuff. I don't want it. I don't want you to, I don't want these to be a safe queen. I want you to just absolutely abuse this thing. So that's that's the model. Uh, that oh, that is beautiful. What is what's this model called? Okay, same thing. This is I call it my EDC, and this oh, is EDC. Uh, so when I carry when I in my intro I I said that you made scalpers, and to me that looks like a scalping knife. Which to and and, and how I define a scalping knife is something that's very all arounder, something that you could use for everything, um, for uh, for hunting, for camping, for fighting for EDC, uh, but just like that classic old American knife. Ooh, look at that. That's What's my hunter. Mean? That's the hunting design. And uh, I actually, one of, my, one of my best friends got one of these and actually went hunting with it this weekend. And he too is a knife nerd and he's been collecting knives and carried two to wait, three wait. knives on him. As hold that up and hold it still. Yeah, look at that. That's beautiful. And uh, he took one of these hunting and... Uh, they processed a deer and a hog with it this weekend. And what he told me was, I have, you know, a half a dozen different skinning knives and, you know, production knives from, you know, very, you know, buck, charade, all these different ones. He said, and they're all going in a box because I will never use them again. Right he on. said, this, this thing, he said, it, it cut. He said, what really impressed me is when we got to the hog and it cut through that inch and a half fat armor on it. He said, like it was butter. Mm. So what kind of edge is, is that a, is that a, oh yeah, but that's a huge endorsement. Is that a convex edge you have on there? Uh, yes. It's, I put, I, I sharpen it down to a, down to the point, but then I don't know if I can show you this on here, but I put an apple seed edge on the very end. Okay. So you kind of zero right. grind it and then, and then apple. Yes. Seed it. I um, take it down almost to a point and then finalize it. I take it down to just, so uh, I it, can get it and then wait, 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 wait. don't put it away you keep putting it away too fast uh oh. there's something i, I want to talk about here the shape of the blade um so i i really love and i know for for hunting there's a lot of use for this too but uh i know for the hunters they're going to use that big generous belly up front a lot i love the the downward uh raking angle of the flat of the straight bit of the blade i'm talking about from the ricasso from the sharpening choil down to the belly i like that angle there because if you're using this knife other for other things like uh cutting straps or cutting rope or cutting through leather or cardboard or whatever the material is going to get uh, trapped in that sort of downward angle part that little triangle created and it's just going to feed material into the belly and um, I, I love that in 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 all sorts of knives. I love it in swords. The swords behind me do that, but in um, e even your your best little slip joints do that. I, I really like that shape. It, 
I this is right now one of my favorite ones that I make. And like I said, this is the production line. This I make I make this same one all the time. And uh, we're actually my friend that was went hunting this weekend. He said, "Okay, I love this. I want it an inch shorter." He said, it's so big. He said, Man, we need to shorten it about an inch. He goes, but I want to keep the same shape because basically I just want to make everything just a little bit smaller. So we're going to, we're going to look at making a midsize hunter. Something, oh, right on. Some, something in the middle range. And uh, So are these production or, or what you're calling your production line, are these also forged uh, or do you these do are a all stock st removal? Stock removal. Okay. Yeah. I start with uh, a two inch bar. Um, a three sixteenths, ten ninety five, and nice. I cut them out, cut the bubbles on them, heat treat them, and then finalize them and clean them up. So, uh, with the with the forging, now you, how do you decide when you're going to forge a knife and, or, like, do you work out new designs in the forge, and how do you decide what is relegated to that? I play more than anything. I, if I want to forge, if I decide I'm going to forge a knife, I go out, I start hammering on the tip and then I start working on it and just see where it takes me. And, uh, I just, I have fun with it. Most of my stuff is stock removal. Sometimes I do a lot of uh, forging the tip. I mean, uh, but like, uh, I started doing Damascus and of course you start with a block, you know, stack of, you know, layered steel and, uh, yeah, I mean, like this one. Ooh. So that right there, it is far from perfect. But that is my first Damascus buoy. Wow. It's a 160 layer ladder pattern. The guard is 80 layers because that was a piece I couldn't use because it had an inclusion. I had to cut it off and I just squished it flat. Hmm. But, uh, this started off as 20 pieces of steel just stacked together. And then I used my hydraulic press and I, I, I just, it took me a day and a half. Wow. And most of the, most of the guys are a lot faster than that, but I was, you know, it was my first time I was completely, you know, wet behind the ears and I was going off what I learned on YouTube and stuff, <laughs> you know, watching, watching Jay Nielsen's Damascus DVD. <laughs> So this was the first, and it was. Do you say uh, 1095 and 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 this six one, nine or not? I mean, this one is uh, this one's 1084 and 15 and 20. 15 and 20. That's what I said. And okay. So, oh, you said 1094. So uh, this was stack uh, alternating stacks. Um, those of us who watch Forged in Fire are are vaguely uh, familiar with some of these uh, processes. Uh, so that's where you weld two uh, alternating stacks of or alternating slabs of steel together. And then you heat them up and you compress them and then you cut them back up and do the same thing over and over until you have however 20 layers, there. 20 layers in a four inch by two inch thick block. You draw it out. I think I drew it out almost 18 inches, wow. cleaned it up, cut it up, restacked it. And I got four pieces that made it 80 layers drew drew it heated up drew it out again and then as i as i cut it up this time i was cutting it three equal pieces and then the last piece i discovered an inclusion about an inch into it so i mm. couldn't use that piece so i just stacked the other two pieces the two 80 layers which gave me a 160 layer billet and then i was looking at that last little short damascus piece and i'm like well i can't let that go to waste so i squished it out and it became the guard Sweet. So have you noticed a difference in performance uh, between uh, the Damascus steel or a mono steel blade? At, uh, a friend of mine, actually, I was showing a friend of mine, it was a 1095 and a 15N20 a Damascus, one of the few, uh, well, the only Damascus that I have. And he was asking if it was stronger or weaker. And, and I was like, oh, it's, um, well, you see, it's, uh, and Actually, I didn't have an answer for him, except if it's made well, it should be as strong as... If you got your heat treat right, a Damascus knife and a monosteel knife should perform well. I mean, it, it, they there, should, there shouldn't be really a difference. I mean, honestly, the Damascus is just sexier. I mean, okay. at, the, at the end of the day, it, look, it looks better, but I wouldn't say Damascus is any more... 
you know, any more effective than a monoscale. It just looks better. And it's also much harder to do and much more, you know, you know, so if, if it took me the same amount of time to make that buoy that I, you know, is one of my others, but it took me a day and a half to make the bar mm, <laughs> to, to start yeah. making the knife, you know? Right. So there was an extra, you know, there was an extra two days worth of work in there before I ever started. I mean, whereas like, like this buoy, Mm, mm, mm. that right there is just a bar of 1095 that I started playing with. And, uh, that is sweet. This is what I like to make. I like big knives and I cannot lie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so like what, what kind of, oh, God, that is beautiful. And I love that, uh, downward turned guard. That guard is so cool. Yeah. I struggled with this one. It was, uh, it, it, it was a work in progress and I threw away two guards before I got there and I still would like to do more stuff to it. It's super plain, but you know, I keep looking at them thinking, okay, what can I do better? And I have a fiber laser and I'm doing all my own, my own engraving now. Like, you know, I can, I can engrave my logo and stuff into the blade now. And so I got to thinking, it's like, well, the next time I do a guard before I bend it, I'm going to lay that thing down and engrave some kind of pattern mm. on here you know do some do something decorative step it up a notch is that a sharpened swedge i see there uh it's it's a false edge it's not okay. sharp okay it, i mean it it'll still be. it'll still do the still do the trick on a on a back cut but it, yeah. it, it will it's not it's it just comes to a point it's not it's not anything close to a sharpened edge or bevel and stuff i mean i think if you were doing a backswing it would probably cut but it, it, I, I'd write I'd it slightly sharper than a butter knife on the, on the back edge. Right. So uh, tell me about the company name, Wolf Dog Armory. What, what is that? Where does that come from? So I was, uh, you know, trying to think of a name. And when it occurred to me that the perfect example was in the living room, I have two giant Alaskan Malamutes. My wife fell in love with the, uh, the snow dog and she was actually teaching it in her classroom. She's a science teacher. And so we, 10 years ago, we got this amazing solid white Alaskan Malamute and he grew into a monster because anything <laughs> above 85 pounds is considered a giant. And so Finnegan became the mascot of the forge. And so, you know, I mean, they're as close to a wolf you can get before mm -hmm. actually having a wolf hybrid or a wolf. And so wolf dog armory. And then two years later, I got Fiona, which is his little sister and from another place. And oh, wow. uh, she's the descendant of monsters too. She's also, she's just as big as he is, which is unusual for a female to be as big as the males. But Fiona's dad was 175 pound Malamute. I got Whoa. the medium the day we picked her up. I mean, it looked like somebody crossbred a dog and a grizzly bear. That's how much I weigh. Jeez, man. That's that's <sighs> like a big dog. Oh, my God. This thing was a, just a monster. And it's just Damn. like, well, if he decides he wants to eat me, I'm done. There's just... <laughs> but the Malamutes are the most lovable dogs on the planet. I mean, they're, they've are they never met a stranger. I mean, if you, if you were to walk in my living room right now, Finn's going to look at you and he's going to run at you, but he's going to turn sideways at the last minute, slam into your knees, and then look over his shoulder at you <laughs> with just a look of adoring love, having never met you. That's uh, I love that. I love so, knowing that. So uh, so when people come to your house, uh, they're 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 careful at first, but they're intimidated. My uh, the first time I had the first time a friend came over when Finn was about a year old and was about ninety seven pounds, my friend walked in, looked at him, and said, "I'm not sure what kind of dog that is, but I would ride that into battle." <laughs> you know, nice. So uh, Wolf Dog Armory, what? How how do you want to see the company grow? What are the what are the knives you want to make, and um, uh, you know how do you want to see this operation grow in your in your retirement years? I I am I'm going to keep making my uh, I'm going to keep making my EDCs and my hunters and like my little mini cleavers and stuff, and you know I'm trying to make I want to make knives for uh, you know for blue collar. I want people that that wear a knife on a belt every day and just they're going to use it and use it for years and then give it to the grandkid, you know, but at the same time, 
my love is making big honking ridiculous bowie knives yeah completely impractical i mean there's there is absolutely nothing practical about this silly thing here and i love it it, de <laughs> it depends on your lifestyle byron i could i could find a way to work that into my lifestyle my very I mean, suburban <laughs> you know i mean if the zombie apocalypse breaks out i'm covered I'm good, you know. But. So you did mention, uh, okay. So I like this uh, getting getting knives in the hands of uh, blue collar. Uh, I would like you to pull out the mini cleaver and show that off as I wax poetic because I like this idea of, um, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be every tool you have. And if you're someone, oh, that's beautiful. If you're someone who's using tools and using them on the regular, and a knife is is you know chief among them. Yeah, to have something real special, um, you know, you're not going to do that for your hammer, your wrenches, and everything. But to have a knife uh, doesn't doesn't I, mean you have to be a, a fancy pants knife collector to have a sweet knife. In other words, you know, uh, I watched a lot of NCIS growing up and everything. And rule number nine: always have a knife. Yep, no doubt. Okay, let's let put this up to the the cam uh, camera a little closer so we can see this. I I pawn I uh, I, I got to. Uh, uh, I got to hold a couple of these at the knife show. These are really cool. Uh, tell me, uh, you know, you have all these other knives with points and big gnarly. What what inspired this? Um, this was a happy little accident. Um, I was in the process of making the hunters. Oh. And all of a sudden, as I was cutting them out, the last piece of steel I was doing ended up short. I was about an inch short of having enough steel to make one of these. And I was like, okay, well, I can't do that. I guess I can make an EDC. But I'd already made 25 EDCs. I was getting ready for Blade Show Texas, and I was my first big production run of, uh, of like this knife. Mm -hmm. And I was flat sick of making them. I, like I said, I had made 25 in a row, and I, I was just kind of done. And at the time, this was two and a half years ago, I guess it was Blade Show Texas. I was getting ready for Blade. It was, it was Christmas of 21. I was getting ready for Blade Show Texas 22. And my first knife show was the second largest knife show in the world. I mean, go big or go home, right? Um, but anyway, I was trying to make this. I was going to make another one of these. And I was like, you know, mini cleavers are kind of hot right now. I've seen people making one of those. I'd like to, I'd like to make one, you know? What the heck? Let's just try it. So I made one that looked like this. It had a blue Choya handle on it, and uh, it was fun. And I made the nastiest, jankiest sheath for this thing because uh, <laughs> I didn't because I didn't know how to do it. I was in a hurry. I was in a time crunch, and so I. But I put one together, and I thought it was going to be good. And it was honestly, it was terrible. If I ever run into the person at Blade Show Texas, if y'all are watching this, come see me. I will give you another sheet <laughs> you <laughs> but, heard it here but uh, then again then again byron there is something to to be said for having an early byron ray sheet yeah it's you know keep it you, oh my god you should see the first buoy sheath i ever made so i made my first buoy knife on my my harbor freight one by 30 and it's rough it's you know i mean it's cool it's rough it's my my my, my friend jones it, it was his 40th birthday present well, a year later, he didn't get a sheath because I wasn't doing leather work at that point. A year later, my friend Boyd turned 40 and I made him a Bowie knife. So this is like 16 months later. The difference between the two Bowie knives is night and day. I mean, you wouldn't think it was the same person that made it. I, my skills had just improved that much over, you know, and I upgraded equipment at the same time so I could do it faster and better. And I made I made him this beautiful Bowie knife with a zebra wood handle, and uh, <laughs> then I had to make a sheath for it. Hmm. It is horrible. I have begged him to throw it away. I, I told him I will make him another sheath, and he won't do it. He said, "Because no, it's the first one." <laughs> yeah, I, I think he's right. I think he's right. He, uh, even if I mean, if I were him, I'd accept a new one and keep the old one. But uh, you you indicated just a couple of seconds ago uh, when when you were talking about the the uh, genesis of the cleaver, 
that you were kind of at the tail end of a run of 25 EDCs. You were just kind of tired of making them and, and wanted to. So how do uh, this was a happy accident, but with other new models, what's your uh, MO for coming up with new models? Is it go out to the forge and play? Is it design or is it just see what happens? Sometimes it's just messing around. It's just coming up with something. Uh, honestly, the EDC, the original EDC, this design, uh, I mentioned my friend, uh, my friend Jones, uh, he requested a knife for his dad's 70th birthday. And he and I worked on it. We drew it up. We came up with this design. And he has number one. I made it and I put like their family brand is engraved on one side, my logos on the other. And it was, you know, it was a gift to his dad for his 70th birthday. But the design was so functional. I liked it so much. I started making them. And when I started making them, everybody was like, oh, I want one of those. You know, I mean, it was so much nicer than anything I'd come up with so far. Some of my first ones were terrible. <laughs> the knife I was making for myself was, I mean, it was similar to this, but I mean, the blade was two inches wide and I made it out of quarter inch steel. I did uh -huh. no weight reduction holes on it. I mean, <laughs> make a damn good club. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good barbell. Sounds like a great barbell. <laughs> it was just part of the learning curve and stuff. So this thing turned out to be, you know, it started off as a single knife designed for, you know, one of my best friends, dad's 70th birthday. And now I've made, you know, I don't know, 60 of them. I think uh, the beauty of that design uh, that you're holding in your hand is that it's, uh, you could scale that too. I mean, that could easily be a smaller knife or a larger knife. Uh, that's, yeah. that's like a, uh, that's kind of a magical, magical. Yeah. That, I don't mean that. Uh, that's sort of a, uh, What's the word I'm looking at? It, it, it's kind of hits all the balance points. That it's, design. it's simple. It's, I mean, there's no finger grooves or anything on it other than right here. And I mean, it's, it's design. I designed it so that it would fit. If you have, you know, just bear paws like me, or if you have smaller hands, mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've put one of these into the hands of a, of a hundred pound woman and she loved it, you know? Yep. And it just, so the designs just happen. Naturally, I mean, for instance, the mini cleaver. Uh, set it. So the mini cleaver has the exact same handle, but it's a little wider. And I didn't want to, I, I didn't have enough steel to do like, you know, the hunter handle on it. So I decided to adopt the EDC handle and just tried to make a mini cleaver. So I made the one mini cleaver with the really horrible sheath. And it was the first knife I sold at Blade Show Texas within 30 minutes of the show open. Wow. Yeah. It was, Isn't that funny, man? So I was like, okay. And I went home and made 10 more. And I have been slowly selling those off for the last year. And I, I, I'm, I'm down to like two left. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, make another batch soon. But it was suggested to me by a master smith, no less, that... Um, Perhaps I should shorten it a little bit. Maybe it's a hair too long to actually be considered as a mini cleaver. So some people called it something similar to a bull cutter, but not with that end on it. But huh. uh, but it was suggested by a master smith to shorten it down to somewhere into here and just make it truly a mini cleaver, and maybe thin this out a little bit. So. Yeah, that could that could be the XL. So it, in in closing here, Byron, what is the knife that you really? Uh, what's your white whale in terms of knife making? Something that you really want to make you haven't attempted yet? More Damascus buoys, because uh, that was that was Damascus is a whole nother level. Uh, I mean, there's so many things you could do with it, and having made just you know three or four Damascus knives. Now it's time consuming. The failure rate is high because you can have inclusions and find problems along the way. But I mean, walking around, I know you've got a blade show Atlanta every year and my God, walking around there and seeing some of these guys, and some of the stuff they do, you know, it's like, I aspire to be that good. You know, I, I've made friends with Niels Vandenberg down in South Africa. And, you know, I aspire to have as much talent as he has in his pinky toe. Because, oh, God. You no, know, I mean, there's these guys that are just artists. And I'm I'm learning everything. I'm self-taught. 
I just, I go down the, I see the rabbit hole and I go down it and it's, it's, it's fun. I mean, I, it's like I said, it goes back to being the IT nerd. I, I see something new and it's like, I want to do this. How do I do that? I mean, it started off by making the railroad spike knives and then to the farrier's rasp. And then, then I started looking at, okay, well, you know, put wood on it. Like I made this handle. I mean, not just made and shape it. I harvested the Choya cactus off my brother's property in Alpine, Texas. I learned how to pour a lubinolite. I learned, I mean, I talked to Jake Thompson on YouTube and figured out how to, you know, use a lumilite and stabilize wood and do all those things. And then, you know, I started was making knives and people were like, well, this is nice, but I need a sheath. It's like, okay, okay, I got to learn leather work now. So I started learning leather work. And, you know, my first sheaths were terrible. My latest ones are not bad. Pretty sweet. I'm, Ra I'm rabbit running. holes, rabbit holes, Byron. We're uh, we're looking forward to you going down the Damascus. That's where we all grow is when we go down those rabbit holes and get obsessed. Anyway, we're looking forward to seeing you go down the Damascus buoy rabbit hole. I know I, for one, am very excited about that. Thank that's you so summer. much, Byron. For Oh, that's this summer. All yeah, right. Well, then starting. you will. We will check back in with you and we will we will see what you're doing. Definitely by summer. Thank you so much, Byron, for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and, and talking about Wolf Dog Armory with us. Uh, it's been Thank awesome you, talking to you, and uh, I'm so glad we had a chance to meet. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. My pleasure. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Byron Ray of Wolf Dog Armory. you got to go to his Instagram page and check out his absolutely gorgeous buoys. You know, that's always my entry point. I'm a big fan of buoys. See, see, I said that twice in a row, the quote unquote proper way. Uh, but also his uh, production knives are so sweet. That EDC reminds me, like I said, of a scalper. To me, that's a classic uh, old school American do all knife. Uh, so go over to Wolf Dog Armory on Instagram or check out his, well, uh, I, I think he's working on his webpage. I was there today. Lots of cool stuff, but I think IG is the way to go. All right. Another way to go is to check us out on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday night knives. All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.